unlike when Russia invaded Ukraine, there's been a very slow start to world leaders speaking up about the atrocities happening in Palestine at the moment. And I just want to read you this statement from the European Union. And if you can't see something wrong with this, then you seriously have an issue. So the European Union made this statement. We are following with concern the Israeli escalation in the Gaza Strip. We urge the parties to exercise restraint and prevent further escalation that leads to more casualties. Are you kidding me? Like, did they say that to Ukraine when, when Russia invaded Ukraine? Did they say to the Ukraine, Ukrainians, hold on a minute, guys, you just stand there and hold still to avoid any more casualties? Like, what, what message are they giving? That it's okay for Israel to carry on bombing innocent people in the Gaza Strip and that Palestinians are meant to just stand there and accept it? I mean, how insane. Why are they not telling Palestinians to make Molotov cocktails? Why are they not telling Palestinians to take up arms? Because isn't that the advice that we gave to the Ukrainians? In fact, why are we not opening the borders for the Palestinians and offering them refuge? How can we do all this for Ukraine, but we can't do this for Palestine? Come on, I'm sorry, but no way can you tell me that this is not to do with prejudice. This is absolutely insane. The day within an hour of Russia invading Ukraine, every single world leader was involved and we were all telling Ukraine, pick up arms, make Molotov cocktails, defend yourself. And here's the European Union telling the Palestinians just to hold tight, just hold tight, just let them bomb your children. Seriously, oh my God, what is going on? So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa salli ala Rasulil Kareem. Amma ba'd. Let me start with the good news, inshallah, that is that a ceasefire agreement, at least tentatively, has been reached. But, I still want to talk about the Gaza situation for many reasons. But I also want to offer solutions. So, I will be talking about what perhaps we can imagine, or from our our low understanding, or at least my low understanding, what maybe the Prophet ﷺ would have suggested to the people in the in the in Palestine to do in the situation that we find ourselves in. Now I'm going to say some things that may become controversial again, so I'm sorry, but uh, this is my feeling of what the Prophet ﷺ would have done. But let's first talk about what is happening in the world. What is happening in the world is that because of the Abrahamic Accords and because everyone is looking to their benefit, because of normalization, because of this peace, what can now happen is that Israel can attack in Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank without any due cause, without any just cause. They can attack Gaza Strip at will with the idea of what that we're doing this because there was an eminent threat that's what was said there was an eminent threat that yes the the small little boy wants to pick on the big strong man because because what you know uh there was an eminent threat so now let's look at this okay Israel carried out a precise counter-terror operation against an immediate threat. Okay. Precise and immediate threat. So there, let me talk about their precision. Their precision was that uh, they had to fire an entire building and kill a little girl. That's how precise they are and that's how much they care about civilians. This is what this, uh, this is their precise uh military does. Now, the point I want to raise is that this lie of eminent threat, right, what is really behind it? That's what I want to talk about. So the first thing I want us Muslims to understand is that, or for anybody to understand really, is that look, in the world there is this duality in politics. On the one side we have nationalism, like, for example, in the United States, we have the Republican Party. Uh, 
And on the other side, we have the Liberal Party, the Democrats. And this is happening throughout the world. So you have this in India, you have this in Israel, you have this in Britain, you have this in Pakistan. Like in Pakistan, you have the PPP versus the Muslim League, for example, the Nationalist Party, right? And with the Nationalist Party and under the Nationalist Party, you usually have the Islamists, the Muslim parties. And so they are kind of like all together. But it's under the big... The big label is nationalism, and then under that is religion, which is part of that area's identity, okay? And then you have the other party, the secular liberal parties. <coughs> now, as you know, Israel has not been able to have any uh, stable government. They have an interim government. And one of the best things you can do if you want to win an election is to create a state of fear, a state of war, is to show that you're strong. This raises the sentiments for... Uh, you know, for example, Netanyahu's party. This creates the sentiments for, oh, if there's going to be a war, then we need, uh, you know, we need uh, somebody like Trump. <clears throat> if there's a threat of any sort, then you need to show you're strong. And so this is one of the reasons this is happening. One of the benefits, at least for sure, is that it makes certain parties, especially the nationalist parties in Israel, makes them look strong and better and that, you know, we're going to take action. And uh, so this is one thing that's happening in the world, is that all the nationalist party, like the Hindu nationalist party, they'll start riots against Muslims or do things against Muslims so that they can win elections. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the final result of democracy. Democracy, the ruling of the majority, where there is a an oppression of the majority against the minority. This is what we see in Israel. This is what we see in India. Do we see remnants of that here in the United States, right? And probably Britain and other places where the minorities are treated differently because of the fact of the existence of democracy. <clears throat> so these civilized nations feel that if there is a so-called eminent threat, what do they do? They strike an entire building and kill civilians with it. So this is the reality, right? I mean, they, they like to project as if they are the civilized ones and the, the other side is not the civilized ones. Now, let me uh, also mention a few other things. Last year, last year when this crisis happened, because it happens every year, right? So Muslims should just expect this to happen every year. And Muslims become quieter every year. Every year we become more quiet, more docile, more dead, more unconscious. You know, we it, 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 anesthesia. You are in a state of anesthesia, even deeper anesthesia. Anyone can do anything to your body and you won't even feel it. What did the Prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The ummah is like a body. And if one part's hurt, the other part feels it. But not if you're in anesthesia. You can, you can rip somebody's heart out and they won't feel it in an anesthesia. And that's the state of the ummah today. Well, they have the entire Arab world locked into normalization. You better not speak against Israel because, you know, we're, we're supposed to be on Israel's side against Iran, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Now, because this uh, foreign minister, whoever he was, he mentioned Iran in this. So, what has happened is, the Arab world has very deep anesthesia. They can't even speak, even if they wanted to. Right? And basically, Muslims in Palestine have been isolated more than they've ever been isolated in their entire, basically, history. Okay. Last year, what happened? <coughs> Last year... When these situation became uh, difficult, Russia came in the middle and said, we will not allow the change of status quo. China came with Russia and also said the same thing. Muslims like Erdogan and Imran Khan, whether real or not real, but they came together and they made a policy statement kind of like pushing or putting pressure on the international world. Because of what? Because of that, because of Russia, because of China, but more so because of Russia, because Russia was actively in Syria and was saying, don't bring your army here to do raids into the Syrian lands. And because of that, and because of statements from Imran Khan and 
and Erdogan, what happened, Israel, Israel had to do a back step. It was almost seen as if uh, the Palestinians kind of like had the upper hand there. One could read it like that at least. But this time what happened? Russia is busy in its war in Ukraine. China just happened to get busy with Taiwan. And I would not be surprised with the types of statements Nancy Pelosi says. Like I read, uh, I didn't read, I heard her say on TV that we would choose Israel even if it meant a problem for the U.S., right? So, I mean, she's very pro-Israel. I'm not surprised if she, not listening to the President Biden or anyone's suggestion, went to Taiwan to just create a situation where the whole world is busy with that so that Israel can do its operation that it was going to do. I wouldn't be surprised, but Allah knows best. That's being That's just guesswork, what I just said. But look, in politics, everything is about timing, right? So when things happen in a certain time, to understand political situations, it's very important to understand the timing. Why, this, why at this time? Well, whether Nancy Pelosi went there to create a diversion or whether she went there on her own, a diversion was created. This Russia being busy, Imran Khan out of uh, his position as the prime minister in Pakistan, and <clears throat> and then uh, China, the China diversion around the whole world. In fact, what was so surprising, brothers and sisters, is last night I went to my wife and I said, oh, you know, this and this is happening in Palestine. My wife is not that interested in politics, but you know, I was just telling her because, and she's, she went on CNN and she's like, there's no news here. There's nothing happening. There's no news. I was like, no, that's impossible. There's something definitely happening. It's not possible that there's no headline on CNN. There were, but it wasn't the first, first page. It wasn't the front page. You would expect something like Israel is attacking an isolated group of people put in the largest prison, prison of the world that, you know what? <clears throat> that it would be headlines in CNN, but it wasn't. And then I went on, I was like, maybe something's wrong. I went on my own phone. Same thing. Saw no headlines last night around maybe 12 o'clock uh, for CNN on the Palestinian issue. Okay. So there, so this was a uh, Russia being busy, China being busy, Imran Khan out of the office was, it's about timing. So everything in politics is about timing, okay? So it was a perfect time to what? To instigate and to uh, further their agendas of ultimately getting their temple where the, uh, the temple mount is to build their temple there, trying to get that agenda going. But that's the long term. But what? To remove absolutely any resistance, what they're doing is they're going and checking the pulse of an individual and seeing, does this person have a pulse? Does he have any iman? Does he have any pulse? Does he have any will to fight? Does he have any will to stand up for? Okay, if these people, anyone who has the will, and, and there's another aspect to this, is that <clears throat> Iran is also has been, prior to this year, one of the things that changed, is that Iran had a lot of, you can say, soft power and, uh, you can say, relationships and allies in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in other parts around Arabia, within Saudi Arabia. Okay, the Houthis, for example. So Iran was able to exert a lot. Iraq, okay, Iraq has two types of Shias. Shias that are pro-Iran and Shias that are nationalists, meaning they're they're just they just want the nationalism of Iraq. Uh, the latest elections that were held in Iraq, the party that's nationalist Shia, they won, and the pro-Iranian Shias, they lost. The same thing, they have lost their you can say muscle in Lebanon, in Yemen with the Houthis, in. Uh, Syria, they've lost their kind of like their influence that they were having that Saudi Arabia was getting very, very frightened of. Okay. They were losing that influence <clears throat> and they have lost that influence. And they also exerted pressure or influences with groups in Palestine. 
So the Islamic Jihad, which is basically a resistance movement, right? Why are you taking over our lands, right? That's not against international law to stand up and fight for if somebody takes your land. But anyway, so this Islamic Jihad, uh, its leader was in Iran. Iran is in new talks for nuclear uh, power. Uh, it's nuclear. Uh, it's it's moving ahead in its nuclear energy, nuclear power. Okay, so this is very concerning for Iran to send a message to Iran and to send a message to um, to, uh, to to anyone in Palestine who would try to reconnect with Iran as it's losing power. This was partly done for that reason, okay? Because the leader of Islamic Jihad is right now currently in Iran. You'll hear this also in this person's uh, conversation. But also notice that uh, it, it's very interesting. I'll show you something interesting. Is that if you look at it, the the one of the ways to know that something is being engineered, okay, is to see if there's a commonality amongst media outlets. Okay, so now let me share that with you very quickly. So notice how this time, the word that was used over and over again was exchange fire. Now notice, Fox News, Israel, Gaza, militants exchange fire. Hindu, the Hindu, Israel and Gaza, militants exchange fire. The Global News, militants exchange fire. Okay, uh, CBS News, at least 24 killed as Israel and Gaza exchange fire. Israel and Gaza militants exchange fire. New York Times, NPR, Israel and Gaza militants exchange fire. Uh... Uh, some other country, Israel, Gaza, militants exchange fire. Uh, again, New York Times exchange fire is second day. Uh, NY1, Israel and Gaza militants exchange fire. Okay. Um, over here in Click Orlando, instead of exchange fires, it's trade fire. Uh, we own, W I O N, Israel and Gaza rebels exchange fire. Right, and of course, uh, the side of the Muslims is always the militants. Right, they're not, you know, there, there's no problem with anyone going to Ukraine and fighting there. I mean, they're they're not militants; they're freedom fighters. Okay, so this is uh, this is as far as the media is concerned, and how you can tell that when something is being controlled, is that they they always have these. And it's not just in the newspapers. It's also when people were talking about this issue, they kept saying exchange fire, exchange fire, exchange fire. Those of you who may remember my talks on the Quran and the number 19 and, we, you know, the 19 hijackers, 9-11, COVID-19, and then 19 people on the Council of WHO, World Health Organization. So again, interestingly enough, and I don't know if it directly connects or not. Meanwhile, in the West Bank, Israel announced the arrest of 20 people, including 19 Islamic Jihad members. Like the, like the, you know, this number 19 and what the Quran says about it uh, is, is very interesting. And you find that in the, the media, usually in these types of situations. The Arabs fought against the Ottomans. And today we find ourselves in this situation after the downfall of the Khilafah and how the Arab world at that time, and I love my Arab brothers, of course, uh, those that are good, but as a whole, the leadership of the Arabs betrayed the Muslim world, betrayed the Ottoman Empire, and so we're now suffering the consequences of going against the Khilafah. And this is a principle that's in... Uh, Many, many scholars have talked about this based upon certain narrations of the Prophet ﷺ. That when you go against a Khalifa and do unjust to him, it leads to havoc in the Muslim world. So when the Muslims killed Uthman, or not Muslims, but when we allowed the situation to occur, meaning we Muslims allowed the situation to occur and Uthman ﷺ was killed, and, and then after that it led to a civil war, and then Ali was killed. Uh, by Muslims, right? So that like really created havoc. So we had the Ottoman Empire, we brought down the Ottoman Empire and that created havoc for us in, in the situation where we find ourselves today. Basically, 
we're relegated to as if we don't even exist in non-human status as an ummah as an ummah okay so now <clears throat> in israel uh you create the situation and it helps especially the nationalist organizations okay and this is the only choice the the world is being given it's like a two party dictatorship either become more liberal or become nationalist and if you become nationalist under that is some islamic parties but it's mostly all nationalism and nationalism means what national nationalism means we're going to oppress the minorities and it also means that uh basically it's it's it it um doesn't help with uh, the situation of the world in terms of solutions because where what was hitler what was uh, all these people of the world war 1 and world war 2 they were all nationalists and they don't have a a, a mind set uh to bring harmony but anyway now what else can we uh learn from here is that muslims in palestine muslims in palestine their number one goal their number one goal their number one goal and i know people are not going to like this but their number one goal has to be toba and number two muslims in palestine their sole purpose in life has to be the protection of al aqsa protection of masjid al aqsa protection of masjid al aqsa protection of masjid al aqsa has to be their priority doing tawbah to allah protecting masjid al aqsa now not all things that are halal are necessarily equally good i'll give you an example it's halal to drink milk it's also halal to drink pepsi they're both halal just because they're halal they're not equal in the same way when we strategize when we do strategy not all strategies are equal they may all be halal strategies but they're not all equal and in this for this reason i say that it is very important for palestinian intellectuals for palestinian thinkers to think about civil disobedience and for civil disobedience to work they must also parallelly to work with that is to have a strong media of their own <clears throat> they must create a situation where there are more and more journalists more and more of their own media they must create a situation where uh civil they can have a a an a movement of civil disobedience now this is one of the things i'm saying <clears throat> why because when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as distasteful as it sounds but this is what the prophet did when he was in makkah the order of the prophet was kuffu aidiyakum keep your hands tied do not retaliate there were 360 idols in front of the kaaba the prophet didn't break any idol when uh, abu dhar ghafari radhiyallahu anhu slapped abu jahal The Prophet told him to leave Mecca. When Yasir and Sumayyah were being killed, Hamza and Omar were already Muslims, and the Prophet said, told Yasir and Sumayyah, "Ya ala Yasir, ya ala Yasir, inna ma'adhukum al Janna. Your reward is Janna. You'll get Janna. Isbiru, isbiru, ya ala Yasir. Be patient, O family of Yasir. Your reward is Janna." So many companions of the Prophet were killed in the Makki phase, but no one stood up and fought back. They protested, they showed resistance, they didn't leave their Deen, they didn't leave Islam, but they stood firmly and they did not retaliate because you have to, in that position where you are weak, and dear Muslims in Palestine. your priority is to protect masjid al aqsa and to do that to do that you must buy time and to buy time you must start movements of passive resi- of of civil disobedience you must buy time by not retaliating when you don't have the strength to retaliate we need to stop just retaliating because we have a few firecrackers in our arsenal they don't mean absolutely anything 
they you are doing nothing except i'm sorry to say i'm sorry to say but we react in a way that furthers their agenda <clears throat> It is in the interest of the Muslims in Palestine that the nationalist parties like Netanyahu and what if most of what's always been there, that the nationalist parties in Israel do not get voted in. It is in the interest of the Muslim population that they try to get the non-nationalist, non-military organizations into power. And to do that, you cannot retaliate. And to make any difference, you must buy time. This is what the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa And it would behoove us, it would be in our interest to follow the footsteps of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa in a situation where he was weak. And he couldn't retaliate. And what did he do? He did da'wah. And doing da'wah even though he was weak. But his da'wah gave him strength. Why? Because they, the sahaba could see Muhammad is coming with arguments. He's coming with Qur'an. He's saying, look, this is the Qur'an. This is the word of Allah. Produce something like this if you can. You have all the poets of Arabia. Come on. I'm weak. I can't even, you know, Muslims are weak. We can't even do anything. So here's the Qur'an. And the Muslims had an intellectual upper hand. If we didn't have a physical upper hand, we did have in Mecca. We had an intellectual upper hand. Muslims were able to critique the habits like killing a baby girl. Okay? Like raiding tribes for no reason. Right? For people having leaders like Abu Lahab. You were able to do a, the Muslims of Mecca were, a, and the Quran did a complete social, economic, political critique of that area that gave them an intellectual upper hand. And so, it would be in our interest in following as much as we can understand the footsteps of the Prophet because trust me, no one knew how to bring a revolution better than the Prophet ﷺ. No one knew better how to change a situation from negative to positive better than the Prophet ﷺ. So, whether it be Hamas or Islamic Jihad, it would be of their interest to do, to, to do an, a, an intellectual assault, an intellectual aggression, and a spiritual aggression, which I'll talk about. But if you want to understand, what do I mean by that? Is that, that if you retaliate, you only allow the nationalists to come. And if you retaliate, the world says, well, I hit you, you hit me. This is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why kufu idea? Keep your hands tied, buy time. Those buildings, they don't come for free. That infrastructure it doesn't come for free. Right? You're just rebuilding the same thing over and over again in this big jail that you got. You have to be smart and you have to buy time. And what will you do while you're buying time? The Prophet did this twice, by the way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He bought time in Mecca by not retaliating <clears throat> because he knew his group was small and had he retaliated, then they would have come with full force and wiped everything off. It took them a long time even to decide to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was going through the, the, the phases of civil disobedience. And while that is happening, he's doing da'wah to them. I know maybe Muslims don't want to hear this, but if we're not strong intellect, strong physically, we can become strong intellectually. How do we become strong intellectually? There must be people that are in Palestine that are specialized in knowing the Jewish religion, in knowing the Torah and the Zuhar and their Kabbalah and whatever else they got. There must be people in Palestine that are willing to engage at the intellectual level the the idea of Zionism. The the very the the, the there is a, a a a strong intellectual movement that breaks the idea of Zionism. And number two a strong intellectual movement that debates in a nice way with the Jewish Orthodox 
Jewish people, the Jewish people, or challenging them on their deen, on their religion. That if you're not strong physically, you can be strong intellectually. If you have the right people and you promote the right people and produce the right, pub, it's absolutely worth it to do that. And the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come sooner if you do da'wah to these people. Doing da'wah to your enemy and then bringing them, some of them on your side. Bringing some of the Jews becoming Muslims on your side. And having those Jews as your spokespeople on media. This is an endeavor that is worth doing. This is an endeavor that corresponds with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But alongside that, there must be a spiritual movement, a spiritual awakening. Coming back to Qur'an, it is the only way to heal the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people have been isolated. The whole Muslim world should be doing dua for them, for their healing. But they have to stand up. You have to stand up, Muslims in Palestine. You have to become spiritual. I remember being in Palestine while the Adhan is going on and all the kids are playing, playing pool. Playing pool table. We need to bring our youth into the deen. We need to bring up their Islamic consciousness and show them that we are weak. Yes, we're put in prison, but guess what? We can argue, we have people, we have the ability to argue with them and defeat them. And we can challenge them and have open discussions with them and debates with them. And we can defeat them. And for the Jews that are against Zionism to establish an alliance with them. Because we know many of these people of Ahlul Kitab will become Muslim at some point. But Allah will help you if you do hit the work of His deen. Doing the work of His deen is protecting Al-Aqsa. Doing the work of His deen is increasing the spirituality of the Muslims in Palestine. Doing the work of the deen is getting people, getting specialized people that can engage people in Israel, the intellectuals in Israel, the professors in Israel. Invite them into Palestine to have debates, to have open discussions. And then what is Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is, we're here, we're blocking the system. We're blocking the roads. We're blocking your entrance. We're blocking you. Fire. We're ready to die. Do it for the sake of Allah. Block the system. Block the roads. Block them. Let them kill you. Do not retaliate. On the outset, it looks counterproductive. Or it seems like you're killing yourself. But no, if you have a good media that will take the picture of those people killing innocent people, the time will turn against, the, the tide will turn in your favor. I'll give you an example of this. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was in Badr, there were only 313. And the other side had more than a thousand. Why was a thousand not able to overcome the 313? Because... They had lost their moral courage. They knew who's on my side, Abu Jahal, who's on that side, Abu Bakr. You cannot win a, against a people who you have a certain level of, uh, you can say, uh, a feeling of humanism for. To kill someone, to oppress someone, you have to dehumanize them. And the role of the media can be great in creating this human, human aspect. The human stories of Muslims in Palestine. They must go to the media, through the social media. There are many ways to do this. These, these are, what I'm saying is not impossible to do. Protecting Muslim Aqsa at all cost. And then also clarifying for the Jewish people, that the real place of the temple is not on the Temple Mount. I have videos on this. I've explained this, that the real Temple Mount is in the city of David. And I know that there are Muslims in Palestine that knows this too. But this needs to become an intellectual discussion. 
Like I said, if we can't be powerful physically, we can still be powerful intellectually. The truth is the most powerful weapon. And <clears throat> become more powerful spiritually. To have adhkar every day for protection. Allahumma inna naj'aluka fi nuhurihim wa na'udhu bika min shururihim. The whole Masjid al-Aqsa should be doing a wirth, should be doing adhkar of protection for the whole of whole of Palestine, the whole of Muslims, the whole of Al-Aqsa every single day. There should be Muslims doing special adhkar in Aqsa every day. And praying for the protection of Al-Aqsa and Mecca and Medina. And so, Muslims in Palestine can do a lot. They need to do that one to the Jewish people. They need to reach out with people that they have that are against Zionism. They need to create a movement of civil disobedience. They need to create and they need to understand Muslims in Palestine. You need to understand that you need to get ready to die because you're in a prison. They can kill you anytime. And they have no heart. They have no heart. They don't even see you as a human. And that is what you have to challenge. And the only way to challenge that is to create a movement of civil disobedience. And if they see that you're organized and that you have power in your organization and that you, after having this power, you're still, you know, using the method of the Prophet ﷺ of civil disobedience. It will make them think twice. And they're, 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 it, because Israel is so divided within itself, you know, they've had an interim uh, government. They're so divided amongst themselves that if it wasn't for Palestine, they may have been in civil war by now. They got so many of their own problems. The Jewish people in Israel have so many of their own problems. That many times even American Jews are like disgusted with the type of racism and the type of uh, attitudes that they see within Israel. But what does it mean for the rest of us besides, of course, doing dua for them? Muslims need to come out of anesthesia. Tell me, that why? Why would someone not at least mention this incident in their Jummah khutbas? Tell me why would this incident not be mentioned in the Jummah khutbah of Mecca and the Jummah khutbah of Medina? Tell me why would this incident and this atrocity and this dhulm not be mentioned, this intellectual discussion? They don't, Muslims don't even want to discuss this at the intellectual level of what's going on. And you know what will be the result? The result is your turn is coming. Your turn is coming. And at that time, no one will be talking about you when your turn comes. No one will be talking about you. There will be no Juma khutbas about you. No one will be raising a voice for you. Because why? Because you did not raise a voice for anyone else. Muslims need to, in Palestine, have an alliance with Christians, Palestinian Christians, and show the world Muslims and Christians are together against this Zionist regime. Why is no one talking about that? Why is no one talking about that, uh, that your Temple Mount idea is in the wrong place? Why is no one talking about that Zionism is a defunct idea, has no intellectual basis whatsoever? Why is no one talking about these issues? Somebody explained to me in the Muslim world that why is this not, these are not topics of your Juma khutbas. Healing comes from talking about the traumas. Let me repeat that. Healing comes from talking about the traumas of of, like, if you talk about your trauma, you get healed. You talk about the traumas of the ummah, you heal the ummah. Why would you not mention these issues via the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet in your Jummah khutbas to heal the Muslims? And without that type of acknowledgement of victimization, you cannot have true spirituality. Because 
in order to move forward spiritually to move forward spiritually you have to let go of the past and you can't let go of trauma unless it's discussed you can only grow this is why when the companions of the prophet sallallahu even though they had been traumatized and even though they had been victimized that when they came to Mid mecca and they were in face to face with those people that had been hurting them they the prophet said no amnesty we forgive you and they became Muslim. And they, they harbored no, like, even after they became Muslim, I still want to hurt them because they hurt me. They didn't have that feeling in their heart. Why? Because the Prophet didn't, the Prophet acknowledged, and the Quran acknowledged the, the, the pain that they went through and the injustice that had been done upon them. Yet Muslim scholars throughout the Muslim world they want to keep quiet and silent as if the trauma doesn't exist. As if the problem doesn't exist. <clears throat> so for the most Muslim world, the way you're going to wake up and not become numb, not go into a state of anesthesia, is to start talking about what's going on. Every year this happens, less and less people talk about it. And next year it'll be even less. And next year after that, it'll even be less. Until it's just, there's no voice. And so, uh, and, and I am talking specifically to the role that the ulama have to play. The role the ulama have to play is that of healing, recovery, giving the confidence back bringing up the intellectual conversations that we actually have an upper hand on. But we're stuck doing things that we don't even have the ability to do. Instead of doing the things that we know we could do within Palestine, and then a complete anesthesia around the Muslim world. In the end, alhamdulillah, the conflict for now has come to an end. In the meantime, it would be, inshallah, we pray that the ummah wakes up and uh, we find, and what should every Muslim do? Every Muslim in Palestine and outside Palestine, we should all be in a jama'ah. We should all be in a jama'ah. And the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when you have a jama'ah of 12,000 people with one emir, can we do that? Can we have a few jama'as of 12,000 each in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in, in the Muslim world? Where Because the Prophet said, when you have a jama'ah of 12,000 people, they will not be overcome because of lack of numbers. Meaning, if they are properly trained and they're true to Islam and they're loyal to Islam, 12,000, the number 12,000 can do a lot. Not ISIS paid groups who don't know how to behave Islamically, no. Authentically Islamic groups, a jama'ah with an amir, with bay'ah. <clears throat> anyway, may Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah ta'ala. And may all of us read Qur'an every day and ponder upon Qur'an every day and invest ourselves in the deen, in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.